All right. Should we should we get started? Maybe I'll I'll uh, introduce myself uh, for those who who may not uh, know me. Uh, my name is Don. I'm a uh, strategic analyst at Onyx Backcountry. I actually grew up in uh, in the desert in Israel, but um, have had a lifelong affinity to the outdoors and and the the mountain west is where I I call home now. I live in Bend, Oregon. Um, I've held many jobs in the outdoor industry. Uh, as a wilderness guide, uh, working as a dog musher in Alaska, I was a geography teacher, and I also hiked about 20,000 miles of trails, uh, mostly national long distance, uh, sorry, national scenic trails that are long distance, like the AT, PCT, CDT. Um, I've also created some routes uh, all over the world, and um, now I call Onyx home, so I'm working on making a really awesome map experience for others to go out and enjoy. Yeah, uh, thanks thanks for that intro, Don. And um, hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining. Um, so if you're just joining on, we just got started uh, kind of giving intros. So um, I'll just quick introduce myself. So my name is Caitlin Gerben. Um, I am a professional trail and ultra runner, and I'm also an Onyx Backcountry ambassador. So currently I live in Issaquah, which is in Washington state. Um, I'm about 30 minutes outside of Seattle and, um, but I actually grew up in the Midwest. And so I, it's um, fun to see people ch like chiming in from everywhere. Um, it was, you know, people watching from all over the country. Um, cause I definitely relate to the Midwest and that's really where I got my start in the outdoors. So, um, as a pro trail, trail runner, I actually, I spend a lot of time moving fast in the mountains. I love um, racing. And most of the time when I'm racing, I do like 50 to hundred mile distances. Um, and so really pretty, pretty long, long ultra races. Um, but I also really love just adventuring in the mountains and linking up big routes. And that's really, I think what got me hooked on running in the first place was, um, you know, just kind of going after that kind of adventurous style. And, you know, I enjoy racing, but I also really love just spending time in the mountains, moving in a lot of different ways. So um, I hold a bunch of um, records on some different routes and stuff. Um, some of these include like the Rainier Infinity Loop, which I did a couple of years ago, the Ptarmigan Traverse, which is one of the routes we're actually gonna deep dive into later in this talk. And then um, more recently I was in Patagonia and did a big glaciated traverse called La Vuelta al Hielo. Um, so I was really excited actually to talk with everybody here about this topic because I really relate to it. Like my start in the endurance world really start, really began with like this exact theme. Like how do I, how do I take this multi-day route and then condense it down into a weekend or a day? Um, you know, for me at the time, um, I had a you know, demanding job and rigid schedule with really limited vacation days. I started running when I was in graduate school um, and I had been spending a few years, you know, getting into mountaineering and climbing and backpacking. And I started learning about all these different amazing routes, like in this new place that I lived in, in Washington state, but almost all of them that I wanted to do took like a week and, and that just wasn't feasible for me. So I began to realize, I guess, like once you, like once I was able to build up that endurance, it really opened up the potential to do a lot of really cool routes and link ups. Um, and over the years, I've spent a lot more time kind of mixing sports and bringing that endurance that I get from the racing into the Alpine and mixing that and kind of some more interesting um, routes and stuff. So um, yeah, I think um, between Don and I, we have uh, a lot of good experience and hopefully some fun tips and stuff to share with you guys. So um, do you want to, I'll pass it back over to Don. He can kind of give an overview of what we're doing today. Thank you, Caitlin. Really appreciate it. And Caitlin's super humble. Um, she is a venerable badass and also a PhD. I can't believe you didn't tell people I, I should call you Dr. Gerben. <laughs> yeah, I guess the relevant part for that is that I really love like geeking out on like <laughs> data and planning and, uh, organizing, uh, yeah, organizing routes and route planning and stuff. So this is fun for me. That's awesome. Well, we're definitely going to geek out uh, on the planning part uh, and the preparing part today. So lots of lots of things to be excited about. What? So let's talk about what's on the docket. Um, we're going to be talking about why, you know, Caitlin just gave a, a good 
kind of introduction, but why would you do something in a single push as opposed to lengthening out over a couple of days or maybe even a couple of weekends? Um, and then we'll kind of talk about how to prepare and plan and execute something like that, because you're obviously, you know, doing something that you have to execute in a, in a really efficient way and, and where there are uh, opportunities for failure. So you have to be kind of dialed in to make sure that you're not taking um, needless risks and also that you are really well prepared and, and traveling efficiently and, and safely. Um, and then after, after we do that, we're going to actually give, uh, do a giveaway, um, which is really awesome. Thank you, Caitlin, uh, for helping us get a bunch of really cool stuff for, for this giveaway. So make sure you folks stick around because there's a lot of stuff that we're going to give away uh, towards the end. Um, and then at the very last part of this webinar, we're going to do a Q&A. Uh, so please feel free to ask some questions. Um, we have some questions from those who registered already. But uh, as we go, I'm sure people will want to know about um, our line of thinking or how to use certain features or what, uh, what we need to do to, to make something like a single push happen. So that's kind of what's on the docket for this webinar. One thing that uh, I want to do now, though, is give all of those who have joined us uh, a little uh, carrot for, for being um, ardent supporters. So you can go ahead and scan that uh, QR code and we'll also paste the URL in the chat. Um, but this is a, a limited time offer for 30% off Onyx Backcountry, which makes it really, really cheap, which is awesome. Highly recommend taking advantage of this. Um, if you're watching this recorded, unfortunately this offer only lasts until um, Friday morning, May 13th, 2022. Um, after that, purchases will be 20% off if you use that URL or this code. Um, you can also uh, use this for a 14-day uh, extended trial um, to play around and get to, get to know the app, but I'm sure you'll love it after seeing this webinar. So let's, let's jump right in. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Caitlin here a little bit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, Donald, I'll, I'll try to cue you up too to, to help give some insight too, because I think it's fun to be able to talk about this type of topic with, um, we both have pretty different backgrounds. And so I think like sharing a little bit of that insight hopefully can be helpful to people in the audience because I know we have um, a really wide range of, of people watching. So um, first, I guess, let's just start with like, how, how do we like to find new routes and discover new routes? Um, I think if we're thinking about like kind of big, fun objectives, maybe that are a little scary to us. Um, sometimes we need a little bit of uh, guidance and encouragement to figure out like what those routes are. Chances are, I think if you're watching this webinar, you probably have like some seed of an idea in your head. Maybe you heard of some friend um, doing some route or you read about it in a guidebook or something. Um, and so I think like, that's awesome. If you've got, if you've got an idea and you're, you're trying to work towards that. Um, one thing that uh, we will actually show this, we're gonna do like kind of a deep dive into a, a map later. Don's gonna share a screen and we'll go through the mapping and stuff. But um, Onyx has a little uh, discover tab where if you're zoomed into a map area, um, you can click on that and it'll show pop up with some different routes and ideas. Um, and so that's one option. Um, you know, when I'm thinking back to like when I was just getting started in the space, what I often did is like, I, I bought a few different guidebooks for like, um, you know, I, like I said, I live in Washington. So like uh, multi-day backpacking trips in Washington or mountaineering routes, classic mountaineering routes in Washington. So I, I got a lot of those books and just kind of started flipping through them for motivation. I'd end up like dog earing a bunch of pages. And, you know, a lot of times it'd be like, you know, you see the distance and the stats and then the route will say like the recommended amount of time it takes to do it. Um, and so that's like a great starting point, but usually for me, especially as I was kind of building that endurance and being, um, doing these really long distances, I started then to think about like, okay, this is like a five to seven day route. I've done something similar to that before in like three days, maybe can we do this route in three days? Um, or could we, you know, eventually like, maybe that's something I want to go and try to do like in a single day. Um, but I think, um, yeah, there's the, those are some kind of my tips. Don, do you have anything else to add on that? 
Yeah, as, as we move to the digital realm, it's a lot easier to access that kind of information. Before it was a little bit word of mouth or you have to show up at a trailhead and just hope and pray someone was there to, to give you the beta. Um, we have this awesome uh, rich content within our app. So you can actually discover trails within an area that you're looking at. And those trails have um, rich descriptions of the route and what you can expect and even some pictures and some um, trip write-ups which makes things really helpful in the discovery phase and also like assessing, you know, if, if what you're trying to do is within your wheelhouse in terms of distance and elevation gain and loss and, and the time that you have. So it makes it a little, a little bit more user-friendly in that way. Totally. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's say you've got, you've got a route in mind or you've got a few routes in mind um, I think some things to consider. So how, how, what's the style you're going to do the route in, right? Are you going to do it in, are you trying to go for a single push versus a multi-day? Um, you know, or maybe you're trying to, like I said, take that week long route and condense it down into a two or three day weekend. Um, I think really it's all the same concept. Um, the biggest things to keep in mind are obviously if you're doing it in a shorter amount of time, you're going to have to cover more distance in, in that shorter time. Um, that may mean that your pace is increasing, or it also may just mean that the length of time that you're moving in each day increases. Um, you know, I've been on a lot of different like backpacking trips myself, where maybe we, you know, have a lazy start to the morning, get up, then go um, relax at camp for a couple of hours, spend some time reading a book, whatever, right? Like that's a um, really fun and um, enriching experience in itself. But also I've been on those same type of routes where instead of doing that, we're actually, we're up, we're moving before the sun's up, start covering that distance, and then we're going until sundown. And I think sometimes like you can actually cover double the distance in that, in the, within the same day. Um, but it means then you're kind of condensing um, the amount of time you need total for, for the trip. So, you know, your pace and how much terrain you're covering in a day varies. But then another thing is like what kind of gear you need to be bringing with you for those different types of, of days. Um, you know, obviously, if you're going to be out for seven days, that's seven days worth of food you're carrying. Um, but on the flip side, if you're doing that same route in three days or two days, um, you may still need the same number of calories. But, you know, you, you know, so I think like having to figure out kind of like how much are you moving and and what things are you bringing with you? Um, you know, we'll talk about gear a little bit more um, in a couple of slides, but you know, if I'm going out and doing a big route in a single day, um, I'm likely not bringing, you know, I'm not gonna be bringing a full camp backpacking setup. So I probably, probably won't have a tent, won't have a sleeping bag, all that stuff. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not still planning for the potential that like I have to spend the night out there. And so I think um, that's kind of a thing to think about when moving, moving fast and light doesn't necessarily mean that um, you can just leave everything behind and just go for it, right? I think um, I try to think about not just like, what is my plan A of like, how can I, um, how can I cover this route in my ideal scenario, but also think about like, where are different places where my plan could fail? And do I have the right equipment with me to make sure that I can still stay safe out there? Um, and so I think, um, yeah, I, I think another uh, cool thing about maybe doing something in a single day or multi-day push is that you, know, you can do both. Um, and I think like this can be a really great way if you're kind of new to condensing trips into a shorter time frame, um, where you're doing, maybe you go out and you do that route, whether it's a traverse or maybe you're climbing some peak that's normally done in like three to five days, do it the standard way, bring all the gear, enjoy the sunset, see the sunrise, right? Like just lean into that experience. And then after you have that experience and you, you have everything dialed, come back with, you know, additional training and the mindset where like, okay, now I'm going to try to do this in a different style. Um, I've done that a, a lot with routes like this. And I feel like it can be a really fun way um, in, in a more, I guess, fun and also like a really confidence inspiring way to maybe go and do a route that seems pretty scary to do in a really short and condensed time frame. Um, yeah, Don, anything to add there? No, that, that's a great call out. Uh, I would also just say like sometimes if it's pretty close to home, like uh, the Ptarmigan Traverse, for instance, is pretty close to Seattle. It's, you know, max five or six hours. Maybe it's worth, you know, if that's if that's a trip that's that you're targeting, 
you go out on a Friday night or a Saturday night and you just head to the trailhead and, and scope it out and camp for the night and just get a feel for where you are and what you're going to undertake and see if it's within your wheelhouse. A lot of times we tend to get fear mongered when we're out on trail or, you know, on internet forums or talking to people who might dissuade you. Um, and a lot of times you find out that things are within your capability if you just show up. Um, but obviously there's a, like a risk consequence uh, kind of quadrant or matrix that you need to, to do for yourself and, and make sure that you're within your margins of safety and risk tolerance. Uh, yep. But I always find that just, just showing up and assessing for yourself is usually the best case. So go out there, you know, a couple of weekends before and just spend the night. Um, you don't have to really go after it. You can just scope it out. Yeah, no, I agree. And like in doing that, like just making sure you're honest with yourself about like the skill set and, and fitness. Like, I think we can kind of like segue into like fitness and capability with this. Like it can be really humbling to like get that fitness wake up call when you're in the middle of like a big route and you've got, like you're out there. Right. So I think like, I would recommend trying to set yourself up for success by like having those wake up calls well before you're even out, um, on the route. And so, you know, when you're thinking about like how to build that fitness and, and training, like simulating the type of terrain, um, that, you know, that the route's going to be, um, simulating, like what kind of gear you're bringing with you, like do some hikes or runs with all of that gear to make sure that like, you know, running or hiking with nothing on your back versus, you know, 10, 20, 30 pounds can be really different. Um, so I think like getting, getting trainings where you can kind of um, plan different things that are stepping stones up to the route that you ultimately want to do, um, which can then also tell you like, you know, maybe, uh, you're totally fine on flat trails, but as soon as you get on something steep, it, it's a different story. Um, and so that can kind of cue you into being like, okay, maybe I need to get more of that steep terrain, you know, under my belt before I'm going out and, and doing this route. Um, and I would just add to Caitlin, um, sometimes we can't, you know, uh, create the, the conditions beforehand. Like, let's say you're going to do uh, a high route that's at elevation. It's very hard to, you know, mimic that if you live at sea level, for instance. So those are things that you may just need to preempt by going to a, a place of higher elevation a couple of days before and, you know, acclimatizing, for instance. So there yeah. are always strategies that you can, you can use to, to better prepare. Totally. And, and I think sometimes like with things like this, you know, you're, you're always going to have a few unknowns. And so I like to think like whenever there's an unknown, like you dial things back a little bit and, you know, so maybe like you don't know how your body's going to do at, at altitude, or, you know, you've never hiked for 12 hours in a day before, but you've done eight hours in your training or something, right? Like there's always going to be a few unknowns there, but I think recognizing those up front and then putting that into your route plan and also um, keeping that in mind when you're choosing what kind of, of route you want. You know, I, I personally like really am a huge advocate for like people just like picking things that are exciting to them and maybe sometimes a little intimidating, but it doesn't mean you have to go and do that route right away. It just means that maybe that's a goal that you hold on to. And then you're, you know, building up towards, towards that through um, training and stuff. Um, and I think this kind of goes into too, like what types of adventure are you looking for with your route? Um, you know, are you looking for something that's purely backpacking or trail running, or are you wanting to mix in some mountaineering or climbing into that? Um, and then all of, all of those things are going to impact like what kind of training and preparation you need and like what core skills you'll need to bring with you onto a route like that. Um, so maybe let's go, um, and go to the next slide. So we're actually going to talk a little bit more about a one route in particular called the Ptarmigan Traverse. Um, and this is a route that um, is really special to me. I've done it a few times um, and actually currently hold the women's record on it. Um, so it's a mountaineering traverse in the North Cascades in Washington. Um, the first party to do the route was in 1938, um, which is pretty, pretty fun. It's, you know, people have been out there for a long time. Um, and if you don't know what a ptarmigan is, uh, the route's named after a bird. It's a grouse that molts um, before the winter and then changing back with the season. So it goes like from a speckled kind of brownish color to then 
um, when it's on snow, it's just pure white. Um, and so the route was named after that. So um, we're going to use this route as kind of a baseline for showing kind of how the mapping works and how to plan out a trip like this. Um, but keep in mind that like this type of you know, things we're talking about hopefully will generalize pretty broadly into other types of routes you'll want. Um, just knowing that there's going to be huge variety in like the type of terrain and everything that we can cover. So um, like I said, this is a mountaineering traverse. It's about 32 miles long, although as you know, if you've done any off-trail travel before, this can vary widely depending on what route you actually take. Um, and it's roughly 12,000 feet of elevation gain. It takes about five to seven days typically for people. Um, but there's a ton of peak bagging potential along the side of this. So a lot of parties will go out um, with camp and then do the whole traverse, but then climb a lot of the peaks um, along the way. So the terrain is a pretty big mix. It's mostly off trail, although you'll see when we're going in the, the mapping app that there's um, definitely some kind of social trails and climbers paths that have developed. But again, that's going to completely depend on like the snow coverage. Um, so it's mostly off trail, uh, you're crossing glaciers, um, you're scrambling, there's steep snow and scree, and then also some classic North Cascades bushwhacking. Um, so <laughs> I think we might have some photos of that too. So um, time frame for doing this route is in the summer. Um, we have a really deep snowpack often in, in Washington. And so we still have a lot of snow in through August. Actually, this photo is when I did the route um, two summers ago in the middle of August. And you can see that um, we're looking at a bunch of glaciers and there's still a lot of snow coverage there. Um, and it starts at Cascade Pass, which is in the heart of the North Cascades. And then it ends, um, the start of it is in the North Cascades National Park, but then after that it, it dips off and just kind of continues along the crest line um, and ends at Downey Creek. So we'll end up showing some, some key waypoints and stuff for that, but, um, yeah, I think like, you know, visualizing and planning this route can be really, um, really key to executing a really um, efficient travel when you're actually going out there, especially if you're trying to do it in a short amount of time. Um, and we'll show this too, but I think like doing that, that prep and navigation in advance, I think could be, can be really helpful. Yeah. And, and with that, it's also really important to, um, especially if you're undertaking something like the Tarvigan Traverse that has, you know, an off trail component and a, and a high route component that, that has glacier or snow travel. You also have a core set of like skills and competencies that you need, you need to have before going in. Um, and that is also relational to your gear too. Uh, and that's something that we'll talk about as we, we look at the map, but maybe Kaylin, you want to do a little preempt before we talk about gear. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like, I, we we're calling this a mountaineering traverse. It's not, it's not a trail. It's not just a, a go out and follow the trail signs kind of terrain. And um, this is really big and wild terrain. And um, it's really important, I think, to check in with yourself about this skill set that you have in this type of terrain. Um, one thing I think that's not unique to, to the Cascades, but unique to um, big routes sometimes is like, there's no you're really remote. Like there's no, um, there's no cell service. Uh, there's no, um, trailheads really within any big range. Like the, the start of this is at Cascade Pass, which is a really popular trailhead. So a lot of people will hike, like it's like two or three miles up to Cascade Pass. You get these amazing viewpoints from the glacier. So that's really popular. But then after that, um, you know, you're, you're going along this crest and, you know, when I I've done, I did the route, um, a few times. And I think in total, maybe I saw like six people throughout all of my time out, out here. Like it's, it's pretty rugged. Um, and so I think, you know, for, especially for a route like this and this kind of terrain, you just really have to be prepared to be self-sufficient, um, which means like self-sufficient on a good day when everything goes well and you, you know, run and set a speed record on it, but also self-sufficient on a day when like weather moves in or you roll your ankle or there's an accident on the glacier or something, right? Like I think, um, you know, when we're moving more quickly through terrain, I think oftentimes the risk factor goes up. And so I think it's just really important to 
think about like, what are those risks that you're taking on? How are you mitigating them? And like, do you have the knowledge and skill set needed to take that on? Um, and if the answer is no, that's totally fine. Like this could still be like a bucket list um, route for you, but maybe it's not a good first step. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, you know, the same thing could be, be said about doing like a really big, even on trail route where you're trying to cover like a really big distance in a, in a day. Um, you know, don't bite off more than you can chew. I think, you know, the mountains aren't going anywhere. The mountains deserve respect. And ultimately like we're just these little creatures moving through them. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, it's, it's fun to have big goals, but also I think just approaching them with some humility and respect for the mountains and the terrain, um, can make sure that we, we stay safe. Very, very well said. And moving in just, uh, a little bit more of a background on the Ptarmigan Traverse because of where it's located in the North Cascades National Park. Um, one of the benefits of doing this as a single push is you don't need to camp on the traverse um, and camping does require a backcountry permit uh, through recreation.gov. So there are some there are some benefits to going a little faster besides, you know, compressing the time, the timeline or, or you know, uh, checking in with your abilities and, and trying to test the, the waters of what you're capable of. Um, but towards, towards the skill set, uh, you know, side of things, I, I find that there's an over-reliance on gear and kind of like a uh, over-indexing on what your gear can do for you. But the, the best piece of gear that you have is between your ears. It's, it's your brain. So having the knowledge and, and you know, the, the skills that you've acquired through past adventures help keep you safe and also help you accomplish those objectives. So that's what I always kind of return to. Yeah, that's great advice. That being said, let's talk a little bit about gear because it's a it's a question that comes up very often. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually I, I have a few more thoughts I'll share, but let's let's go into the gear and then we can um I'll kind of dive into that. So um so this is just a real quick overview of some of the gear, the type of gear that I would bring along for a route like this. Um, one of the most important things I think about doing big routes in a single day like this is to get your gear dialed, like make sure you know how to use your stuff, make sure you know what the limitations of all that is, um, and make sure you're bringing appropriate gear given what your objective is for that day. Um, and so I'll just start with the caveat of like, this is going to entirely depend on, first of all, like what route you're doing, but also what the conditions are, what your experience level is, um, and what your risk tolerance is as well. So um, I guess my main takeaway for just showing this photo is that even though I'm, you know, moving light and fast and running through a lot of this train, I still have with me all of the gear that I need to cover this type of terrain. It just may be um, whittled down a little bit. So in here, um, I have some version of all of the 10 essentials. I know a lot of hikers and backpackers probably know what those are, but that includes things like an emergency bivy bag for like an emergency shelter, first aid kit, and some sort of like satellite communication device. Um, also, I have lightweight mountaineer, mountaineering gear. Um, again, if you're not doing a mountaineering round, you're not going to need that kind of gear. Um, but I think just to follow up a little bit on what we were just talking about, like this is kind of a good opportunity to just talk about the different, the range of people and different um, avenues that people listening to this webinar might be approaching something like this. So some of you um, in the webinar may have already a really strong background in mountaineering and climbing. Um, and others of you may not have that technical skill set, but you might already have a really strong endurance and fitness background. And so I think most big routes like this are already really technically challenging and really physically demanding. But if you're trying to do them over the span of just a few days or one day, it, it you know, increases exponentially um, how challenging that can be. So we're not going to have so much time in, in this class, in this course, really to dive too much into like building up the skill sets and stuff. But, um, you know, I think, like I said before, some of my advice for someone who wants to tackle a route like this is, first of all, check in with yourself about what skills and experiences you need to build. And then set goals along the way that push you towards that, you know, like, um, set the little stepping stones of like smaller routes or similar types of climbs where it's just like a short thing from the car or something where you can start to build those steps towards this big goal. Um, 
And once you've identified what those knowledge gaps are, maybe that you have for yourself, then go seek out resources. Um, you know, attending a webinar like this is a great place to start. Um, I've also personally learned a lot through taking courses with different like outdoor groups. There's a number of, um, you know, nonprofit outdoor groups throughout the country that that provide um, training camps or courses and things like this. Um, guided trips or camps or coaches and mentors and stuff can all also be really helpful. Um, and then the other thing is like start small. So if you're new to endurance, if that's the aspect of this that's that's new to you, maybe take a route that you would normally do in four days and then see if you can hike a few extra hours each day and do it in two or three days instead. Right. Like take little bite sized chunks out of out of what your your normal is and see um, push yourself a little bit in, in a safe and controlled way and see how that goes. Um, similarly, like if you're new to mountaineering and alpine travel, maybe do a route like this, um, but over a few days, like do it in the standard way with all of the gear, with all of the extra stuff um, and learn along the way, like take the time to really like fine tune those skill sets so that when you can come back later, you know, you've already got that experience that, that allows you to kind of whittle things down and, and move a little bit faster. Um, yeah, I think Dan, uh, Don, sorry, do you have um, anything else to add? I know your, your gear too could be a little bit different because you're coming at it from a little bit more of like a backpacking perspective. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, I, I tend to probably overpack when it looks, when, when you look at it in comparison to Caitlin, uh, but try to keep everything very light um, and, and, and to the essential. Um, but, but for the most part, I, I don't really think about gear that much. I obviously take, you know, the important things that are necessary for the objective. So if we're talking about the Ptarmigan Traverse, you know, um, crampons and an ice axe are kind of non-negotiable. But then there are other things that are, are a bit more ambiguous, right? Like, should I bring a down jacket or can I get away with just a rain jacket? Those are kind of decisions that you'll have to, to make uh, by yourself. What I'm more interested in is, is the mindset. Um, and I have this mindset that I've kind of adopted over uh, many thousands of miles and many stupid mistakes. Uh, it doesn't matter what you bring, you're, you're never gonna have exactly what you need or enough of what you want. So instead you need to embrace your situation. You need to adapt to it with whatever you have at your disposal. Usually it's gonna be creative thinking, and then you need to overcome it. Um, and that keeps you safe and it keeps you from getting needlessly frustrated. I love that advice. Yeah, that's, that's similar. It's like really, I mean, even, um, you know, when you think you have your gear perfectly dialed, there's going to be some scenario that comes up that you just have to adapt on the fly. Um, and especially when you're working with a limited amount of things on your back, you know, really knowing like how to use things in different ways and, and keep, um, I don't know, keep, keep focused and, and stay positive in, in that scenario. Um, and maybe hunker down if you need to, if there's a storm, right. There, there's a, a great saying that I learned in poker, but, um, it's very applicable to the outdoors. There's no such thing as a bad fold. And I, I find that like yeah. a really apt, you know, like it's, it's never, it's never a bad thing to just say, like, I'm, I'm going to, Put up my tent or i'm going to go back to the car yep yeah I, I actually um i think that that's great and that's always something that i keep in mind when i'm out there on a big route especially you know if i know i'm moving in a way that um i don't have a lot of margin for error because of maybe the you know the style of route i'm doing or the way i'm doing it or what i brought with me and so there have been so many times um where i've you know, everything was going right and then something wasn't. And then, you know, I bailed. And I think that that, um, usually it's those moments where we're bailing on something where I think we end up learning a lot more than if we just went out and had a, a great day. Um, so, you know, so some of my most memorable moments have been in times when I bail and like, usually it comes after, like I've gotten back to the car safely, I ate a burger and drank a beer and now I'm like chatting with my partners about like, okay, so what happened there? And then like, you know, once you, once you remove yourself from the, from the scenario, it can be easier to re reflect back. But um, yeah, I think like just not, you know, personally, I, I don't, I try not to, to push things too much into that risk space when, um, you know, when I know I just don't, you don't have that much margin and it's always better to, to see another day and come back to the mountains later, right. Than than push it. 
Totally agree. Uh, should should we open up the map and start playing around with uh, yes. with our traverse? Let's do it. Awesome. Okay, I'm gonna shift over here now to our uh, our Onyx uh, backcountry. This is the web map. Uh, we obviously also have really good uh, mobile apps, but I do most of my planning on the desktop. I just find it to be a little bit easier to, you know, create a route and and play around with importing and exporting and creating waypoints and such. Um, but as we as we talked about earlier, um, you know, if you're not really sure about what objective you want to look at, we have this awesome discover card that Caitlin mentioned, and that helps you find uh, nearby routes. And we also um, have things like mileage and elevation gain and loss and you know difficulty level. So it makes the discover aspect a lot more uh, user friendly and approachable than trying to find you know books and getting beta from people. And um, you know th there's a lot of disparate sources and it's kind of hard to maybe just hone in sometimes. So I, I like having everything in one place. But as you can see here, we're looking at, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, just agreeing, that's all, you're good. <laughs> So here we're looking at the, the Ptarmigan Traverse. Um, what's interesting is this isn't, as Caitlin mentioned, the, the uh, North Cascades. Um, although, it, you know, Caitlin said at most she's seen six people on this high route and it's a very popular high route. It's actually very close to um, quite, quite a popular national scenic trail called the Pacific Crest Trail. So it, um, we can actually see it on the map here. I'll try to pull up a section of it. I think this is probably a section of it here. Yeah. yeah. So really, really close by um, to what I would call like a highway of a hiking trail that has thousands of people going on it uh, on, on any given year. But we're kind of out more into the mountains and more um, in, in the remote area. So think about how remote the PCT is if people have ever done a section of it or seen a video on YouTube. And now we're going kind of a step further. So understand, respect, and, and show some humility to that is, is what I would say. Yeah, totally agree. Um, so I think uh, we can show a little bit of the route and kind of how this works. And I, I think like one, one thing that um, always takes more time than you think is navigation. So I like, I really, I think like if we're thinking about like how to move efficiently through terrain, like getting your navigation dialed um, can just save you a lot of time. And so one way that I've really liked to do this, and I've used Onyx a lot for this, is like previewing the route as much as possible at home. Um, because, you know, especially when you're doing stuff that's off trail, I find it really helpful to like look at, you know, kind of the profile of the terrain or the mountains. And then when I'm actually there and standing there and there's wind whipping at me from the side and I'm cold and hungry, like I look at the past, I'm like, oh, that looks familiar. I think we go up there. Um, and with this route in particular, it's actually one of the things that I really remember from this is like, there's so many places where like you get up to a pass and you're just looking like into the abyss of like crazy glaciated mountains and cliffs and like really intense terrain. Um, and like the first thought for me, most of the time is like, I don't even know how it's possible to get out there. Like that doesn't look feasible. And then, you know, we'll kind of look at the map, figure out like, okay, so it's that, that saddle. Um, and then you kind of weave your way up. And then, you know, I think it's like when you're good at the route finding, then the terrain, the route just kind of reveals itself through the train, right? You find these little ramps and ridges and stuff through the train that actually is quite easy to move through relative to what it looks like from afar. Um, and so I think like being able to look, kind of do a deep dive and look at some of this stuff from the safety of my computer screen at home in advance um, helps with just recognizing that terrain so that when you're actually out there, it can be a little bit faster of a, you know, decision point. Yeah, when you're off trail, you're always looking for the path of least resistance. And sometimes that's not obvious. And also one thing that I also like to tell people is, you know, when you're given a route like this, um, it is off trail, so it's not prescriptive. You don't need to stay on the line that you've either created for yourself at home or someone has given you. Um, it's generally going to be always a little bit different, um, and we'll even describe some of those differences uh, as well. But one one thing I wanted to also mention is that um, this route is a, a north to south route, um, and you can do it south to north as well. But generally, people do it from north to south because the elevation gain. Um, is much less if you go in that direction. So 
that that's to say when you're when you're um going on on a high route or a traverse you have to make these decisions uh in the moment as well as like big picture right like you have to decide what's what's better logistically for how i'm going to get to the trailhead but also in the moment you're, you're going to say like how do i get to that saddle over there through this ice field so you're always making these macro and, and micro decisions um, and keeping those in mind helps mitigate risk yep so i'll just kind of uh turn the map around to uh orient ourselves based on the direction that we're going to go in um, and we actually start the targeting and traverse at uh, a trailhead right here um what what i really like about onyx maps is that within within the, the platform we have rec points so this is a camp rec point and you can get a lot of uh, underlying information about it which is really helpful for planning. So for instance, there's a campsite at the trailhead here called Johannesburg Camp. And there's uh, reservation information here and I can just click on it and um, create a, a reservation or at least see what you know the availability is. So in case I wanna, as I mentioned before, come to the trailhead and, and spend a night and just assess, or maybe I'm not trying to do this as a, as a single push, I have that option there, which is really awesome. So I just wanted to highlight that feature really quickly at, at the trailhead. So um, I think what's also really helpful when, when planning is to create waypoints ahead of time um, that help you kind of preempt what you will find or what you can expect. So for instance, we know that at the start of the target, uh, Traverse, we have a uh, really unique feature called Cascade Pass, which is a, a really, really popular um, saddle that people go to. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, there's a there's a trail that you can see here kind of winds its way up. What I like what I like to do is actually create waypoints at those locations and, you know, make little notes to myself that I can really quickly refer to in the field. So it helps kind of keep that cognitive load down. As I mentioned, when you're off trail, you're making all these micro decisions to navigate and route find. And if you can keep the decisions at, at a minimum, you actually decrease your fatigue and you can make better decisions. So as much of that as I can front load in the planning phase, I'm gonna benefit from that in the field. So right here at Cascade Pass, I'll probably just make a waypoint and it's super easy. I just title it and I'll give it a really nice, uh, waypoint icon, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll just stick with the X for location. And I know that this is kind of the end of the, uh, the trail part. And now the route kind of begins. Um, and how do I know that? Well, I can, I can move into satellite view and actually zoom in and see the trail kind of disappear into, into, uh, into nothing. And you can <laughs> see that there are other trails here as well, still. Um, but the the traverse kind of goes off to the south where there there are no trails. It's just a boundary between the the national park and the, the wilderness area. Um, and what, what's awesome about Onyx as well is you can actually go into 3D mode and it helps you visualize even further. So here's the Cascade Pass, and I can tilt my screen into 3D mode, and really it helps me visualize what I can expect when I get there, which is pretty awesome. So I'm looking at the saddle here. This is where I came from. And that's where I'm going. Um, what's, what's really awesome as well is because this is an off-trail route, the, the path that we have here is, again, not very prescriptive. It's more of like what you know most people go towards. But the satellite view and 3D help you also visualize what you can expect that um, other people may have not uh, mentioned to you. So for instance, if we look here, you can see some social trails along uh, the ridge line here, and that's probably created through overuse, uh, but it's something that we can use as well, right? So we don't have to stick to this saddle here, or sorry, this, uh, this ridge line here. We can actually go uh, down here and follow the social trail. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, that's also dependent on uh, prevailing conditions, right? So perhaps it's a really high snow year in the Cascades, and this trail is not accessible or the slope angle is too is too um, aggressive and it might be dangerous and you might want to stay on the ridge and then traverse higher. So it's all dependent when you're off a uh, off trail, making those decisions that are going to uh, increase your your risk, uh, decrease your risk and increase your safety. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I love like this 3D view, for example, like you can see like, without even being there, like you're looking at, you, know, you can imagine being on, on the pass and just looking out at the mountains, you see all these different saddles and peaks. And it's like, sometimes hard to, you know, if you've never been on that route before, it can be hard in advance to like know exactly where the route goes, but it can be so much faster, more efficient with navigation. If you can like look at the profile and be like, oh, that's, that's the saddle. That's where we're aiming for that peak or this thing. So um, being able to kind of look at this in advance, I think I've, I've personally found really helpful for that. So like you can see um, cash coal, which is like where the blue line disappears over that. Yep. Over that little saddle. So, you know, knowing like, okay, that's where we're aiming for, because there's a good chance you'll get out. You know, once you get off trail, there's no, you know, <laughs> there's nothing to follow. And there may not be any footprints in the snow for you to, you know, kind of follow along with. Um, maybe do you want to show some of those other waypoints? Yeah. So I was going to say, just so we don't, uh, spend a lot of time, uh, me creating a bunch of waypoints, I'll just, I, I've created these ahead of time, but, um, I'll just kind of surface them. Um, they're made by, uh, they're shared by Caitlin to me and they help me kind of, uh, you know, assess what I'll find uh, on the trip. So she mentioned cash coal is kind of the first, um, waypoint on our trip and that's, you know, we visualize that uh, that little pass there, and that's that's what it looks like here. And we made a little waypoint, um, but that's kind of the first decision point, right? That's where you have to uh, kind of assess where you're at. And yep, exactly. That I think like one thing that I like to do with waypoints, whether you know whether you're marking it as a waypoint or you just like decide with your partner or your group, like pick out in advance different like decision points because. Um, especially, you know, if like conditions are a little bit different or, um, weather's moving in or something like there's, especially for a committing route like this, like, you know, cash coal, you know, maybe I've decided in advance, like, okay, this is where we need to have our first like check-in as a group or with my partner and be like, how are we feeling? Is this still a good plan? Is this still safe? Because once you start dropping down over that ridge, now you're, you're starting to get, you know, more and more remote, um, versus just heading back to the car, which at that point is still pretty close. Yeah, it's almost like the first crux in, in your trip. Um, and then yep. also cash coal specifically, I mean, you can see this on the map without ever having been there. It's going to be uh, kind of like a committing spot, right? You're descending yep. down into a, a more remote region. So it's great to just check in with your group or with yourself and see how you feel. Is it comfortable? Is what you see ahead of you seeming within your competency or are you sketched out and maybe it's time to, to go back? Yep. So, okay, you, you do, a, you, you get to this coal um, and you traverse a, a snow field here and then you, you do this big wide traverse and you get to something called Kool-Aid Lake, which is basically a tiny tarn, like a high alpine lake um, that's totally snow uh, fed. And mm -hmm. you continue a traverse over some, some uh, e either snow or it looks like um, really loose, you know, scree or, or rocks and you can even actually see a, a social trail here that might be uh followable but then you get to to the, something that you share a waypoint that you shared with me before before this uh yeah. webinar so can you tell me about the red ledges a little bit yeah so there's this this um area the spot called the the red ledges which is kind of another crux and it really depends on what the snow conditions you're going to find are um actually it's inter interesting like the satellite here like when i did this route even in mid-august um that whole social trail we were seeing was covered in snow so there really like there was no trail it's still snow um so yeah the the ledges is just kind of a another spot where you're you've got this really tricky um kind of rocky cliffy section with some loose scree and then maybe there's like a moat with the snow um, so you kind of have to go in between that so that's like a, a good thing that if you are going to go out and do this route like maybe checking in to see if other parties have recently done it like what the conditions in that spot are like um, but it's also kind of good to know like that's like whenever there's little cruxes and stuff like that in the route like know that maybe that's going to take you a little longer than you think um, so you know building in some extra time around things like that and then if you get there and surprise yourself and actually it's fine, like, you know, you've got some extra backup time already built in. Yeah. Great, great call out too. And, and if you're, if you're getting this information from a friend, like I did from Caitlin, 
um, you can actually create notes uh, for what you can expect there, right? Like mm -hmm. um, you can kind of preempt what you'll find and change it. it you know, it's going to change depending on when you're there and, and who you're with, but it's great for kind of front loading that, uh, you know, anticipation. What I really like too is um, I can add, I can add uh, pictures to these waypoints as well. So Caitlin shared a, a photo with me about of what the red ledge looked like when she went through on her uh, FKT, and um, I can add that there. So I can see, you know, when I get out in the field, I can see what her experience was like and compare it to what I find. So it's just a nice little feature there that I like to always use if I can. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you, you've passed the, the two big cruxes and now you're kind of like in high route mode. You're, you're up on the mountains and you're, you're kind of traversing through snow fields and glaciers. Mm -hmm. what, what's going through your mind or how are you keeping um, efficiency or like nutrition um, concerns? Yeah, out? Good, good question. I mean, I think like a lot of it is just keeping up with consistent movement. So that means for me, like I'm often eating while I'm going and maybe I'm not going to eat during one of the cruxes, like, but you know, when you're on a, a section where it's a little bit of easier travel, um, you know, making sure you're kind of keeping up with eating. So, um, I, you know, I, my role for mountain food is like literally anything that sounds good to you is a good thing to eat. Like calories are calories. So my favorite thing to do is go shopping for adventures like this because it's like get the grocery cart, like throw in the Snickers bars, throw in the Twix, throw in like the cheese and sausage, like all, all the, the food that, you know, I love, but don't eat on a daily basis. Maybe <laughs> Like that's all fair game. So, um, yeah, so uh, this is cool because we're actually starting to see some of the glaciers. So, um, the, you know, as we mentioned before, this ride actually does involve a lot of glacier travel. Um, and some of the crevasses in here, like, you know, again, this is really just depends on the season. Um, I think I have maybe some photos. Um, I'm not sure if some of those waypoints or in other places I can share, but, um, you know, the conditions on the glaciers can be very different. Um, and so just making sure that, you know, you know how to navigate on a glacier. Um, a glacier is not a place where you want to follow someone else's track, um, you know, as a GPX track, because every year, every season, every week, even it can be very different. Um, and so just, you know, keeping, keeping that in mind, if you're out in that terrain, um, but spider formidable coal is a really amazing viewpoint, really cool high point. Um, you're really in, in the thick of it at that point. Um, it's yeah. pretty visually stunning just looking at it here, uh, but I can see what you're talking about. There's uh, exposed crevasses on this satellite imagery here. So I, I would definitely, you know, I, I would make a waypoint here and say, you know, definitely a good, a good note that you included here is like, you might want to rope up or yep. you know, be very exactly. careful. And dropping, doing. dropping down that coal actually is a really, um, really steep section, which, um, I, you know, it again, depends on conditions. I've read reports from people that they're, you know, placing protection in the snow and repelling down it. Um, although, um, you know, if you get, it, again, it just will really depend on like your, your mode of travel and what the conditions are like. Okay. So let's say we, we've made it past all this snow. What, what, what can we expect? Uh, for the rest of the trip? It looks like more, traversing, yeah. more snow, more traversing a lot of, um, a lot of, side hilling on, on snowy slopes. Um, yeah, I think, you know, like with this route in particular, like I said, there's just, the terrain is really big. And I think you get a sense of it from, um, from the satellite 3d imagery, but again, just being able to like, you know, every time you're at a high point with a good viewpoint, stopping and looking at, you know, what's up ahead and where's the route going, um, can, I think really help with like making sure you have efficient travel because, Again, following, like we said, um, like Don said, the, you know, especially like traversing and big mountaineering routes like this, like the, the track is kind of a guidance, but um, ultimately you have to be making your own micro decisions about where to go as you're, as you're traveling along, along there. Yeah. And speaking, speaking about, you know, making your decisions actually when I, I, I forgot to mention this, but I also just created a route as well beforehand. And you can see that red line there. Oh yeah. Uh, but, but. Uh, Caitlin actually mentioned that she went a different way during her FKT attempt in certain places, and she actually shared some alternate routes with me. So thank you for sharing those. Those yeah. are nice shortcuts. Um, but it's again, it's conditionally dependent, right? Like 
it could be that this scree field is inaccessible with snow and is uh, not within my risk tolerance and I'm not going to make that ascent. Um, but then I have to go this kind of long way and switch back on a, on a, a large traverse. Um, but yep. yeah, there's, you, your route is going to always be a little bit different than what's prescribed uh, when you're off trail because you're going to have your own adventure. Yep. And I actually, I mean, like not just generalizing to like any route and any sort of like planning and prep like this, like, I think it's, it can be a really great idea to get multiple sources of information for, for your routes. Um, uh, just so you can look at that in advance and kind of figure out like, are there different, um, yeah, are there, are there different or safer options or backup options or plan A or plan B? Um, but ultimately like, don't, you know, I like just like don't just blindly follow someone else's path. Um, and I think that goes for GPX tracks, but also definitely goes for even like following someone's footsteps in the snow or a Karen that someone built. Like you got to remember, like you have no idea who that person was. They they might not have any idea what they're doing. So like you know, sometimes it's I think like just remembering like ultimately you're responsible for yourself and like making those decisions. Um, you know, rather than following. And I think if you are in a position where like you have to be following, um, you know, being with a, a person that you trust that, um, you know, or a guide that can, can help get you that experience so that you can go out and do something like this on your own. Um, but with, you know, with the right kind of buildup for that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great call out, Caitlin. And, and one of the things I love about uh, the Targan, uh, or sorry, about Onyx and specifically is that within our rich content trails, we actually have some of those, you know, route descriptions that are good resources to use about what you can expect. And they're, you know, really well-maintained kind of like informational, you know, this one's quite long, which is awesome. And it kind of takes you through the paces of what you can expect. Mm -hmm. um, and it also gives you an overview of, of the trail as well, which is really helpful and um, kind of getting all that context that we've been talking about if you don't have access to an expert like Caitlin. Um, Don, maybe do you want to uh, zoom out so we can show just kind of where the route finishes and then we can uh, have a relevant um, <laughs> yes. thing to point out now if we get, oh yeah, you're going to add. I'm going to, yeah. So one, one really cool thing about Onyx is um, you can create your own waypoints like I have, but you can also get shared waypoints. So uh, Kaylin was nice enough to share some relevant waypoints with me that I wasn't aware of. Um, for instance, there's a heinous bushwhack um, towards the end of the trail on, on the Bachelor Creek. And, and she also, thank you, Caitlin, for including a picture of what you can yeah. expect there. Um, the the but, photo actually makes it look not that bad. <laughs> so if that's any indication. <laughs> but um, yeah, and actually one thing that is uh, important to point out now, so actually there was a fire um, in the whole Downey Creek region where, um, in the, that valley where the trail finishes, and so currently that's closed, um, and so I, just a, re a reminder that I think it's important with any, any big route, like always check with the local land management and just check on trail status and updates and stuff, um, and if you did that, for the ptarmigan, you would find um, if you're looking at Downey Creek, um, it's closed right now. And so, there are alternate ways to um, to extend and finish and exit the ptarmigan traverse. Um, some of them involve going over Dome Peak, which there's a little waypoint there. Um, I'm not going to get into that because they all are fairly spicy and um, involve a mix of of um, alpine uh, you know, travel, again, like a lot of the ptarmigan, but anyway, just, just to point out, so if you're um, putting this on your bucket list, maybe uh, keep that in mind and, and look at it in another year. Yeah, and um, to, that, to that end, actually, uh, Onyx is a great resource for finding out about those closures. So I, I just went here to the Downey Creek Trailhead and I see that there's some additional information here um, with, a, with a website actually, and it tells me about you know, the area and I can, I can go down here and actually um, look at all the trailheads within that area. And if I click on Downey Creek, I can see that it's been temporarily closed. So you can actually find all that information within, within the product, which is awesome. Yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. Um, so I think like, like you're saying, like a lot of this, um, you know, being efficient in your navigation and your travel um, is really important. And so a big part of that is doing your research and getting everything dialed before you even go. But then when it comes to like, how do you actually execute that in the field? Um, and so, you know, like 
we're showing like, you know, this, what we're going through and doing now with looking at waypoints and visualizing the route, um, I think is something I do frequently for, for this type of travel. Um, but then you can actually uh, share it to your phone app and then it's all integrated there. So all of those waypoints and everything will show up in your offline maps. Um, and so Don's gonna do that, but I think, um, yeah, this is just a, a helpful thing to know that like, you know, you can download the maps offline and access them on your phone with all of your notes and waypoints and information, you know, that you've put for yourself there. Um, of course, make sure that if you're using your phone and you're relying on that for navigation, that you have a backup, like battery source or power source for your phone. Um, but it, all of it works on airplane modes. So you don't need service to be able to see where you are. So uh, Don, do you want to show how that works on your phone? Yeah, definitely. So I'm just saving uh, an offline map here and it, and you, you get a nice little explanation of what's happening because obviously I'm not going to bring my laptop out into the Tarmigan Traverse. So it actually syncs to my phone um, and I'll just display, uh, you know, that there. And I'll also do an offline map on my phone to show how that works as well. Um, but once I, once I've just done what I did on the screen, it's actually syncing to my phone and I can go to my phone here and open up uh, Onyx Backcountry. And I can see uh, my route, which is awesome. And everything should be saved in my offline map uh, card. You can see here it's already downloaded, which is awesome. And I can uh, create a new offline map if I want to, right? So I have, I have the boundaries of the other one and I can save this one as well. Um, and I can also check uh, by going into offline mode to make sure that my offline maps work. So this is a really good, uh, I, I, I do this every time I go out into the backcountry. I make sure that my offline maps actually work before I head out. Um, because a lot of times you think you're downloading it or you don't remember that you downloaded it. Um, and then you get out and you have no information and you're kind of going <laughs> blind. And that's, that's, a, yep. that's a showstopper basically, right? Uh, yeah, so, I've had before where it's like, it says it's downloading, but then for some reason it pauses and then I forgot to go back and make sure it finished downloading. Um, so yeah, always worth uh, double checking that. What's nice is it gives you like uh, an indication that it's done downloading, but I always uh, go uh, for the offline route. Uh, I, I turn my my Onyx Backcountry app into offline map mode to make sure that that content is still there and accessible and that all that data that I spent a lot of time planning is still usable to me. Awesome. Um... Cool. That that's fun to dig into the route and like take a little bit of a deeper dive in that. Um, hopefully, people are um, inspired and also have a little bit more of a tool set to go and plan plan a route. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for um, for joining us for this. And and if you made it this far, we really appreciate you and and want to offer you some free stuff. So um, you can go ahead and scan that QR code. Uh, and be entered in to win um, some awesome stuff from Goo, Lecky, the North Face, and us as well. So please, please feel free to, to either go to that URL. I think we'll, we'll put it in the chat as well um, or scan that QR code. Um, please remember that in order to apply for this giveaway, you need to have at least a, a basic account with us at Onyx, which is free, uh, but please just register for an account before you enter the giveaway or else you, you won't be able to. Um, so with that, I'll just uh, kind of transfer over to uh, a q and I know we had some some questions come in. So I'll pull some of those up and we'll kind of rapid fire ask you some questions, Caitlin. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so I see a question here. Um, physical exhaustion is one thing with uh, multi-day that you typically face, um, but what do you do with like continued exhaustion in a single push when you're shortening, say like a seven day trip into a three day trip? What's, mm -hmm. what's a tip that you have for like keeping your mental game strong? Yeah. That, I mean, like long distance stuff is really mostly mental, isn't it? Instead of physical, um, once your mind starts quitting on you, um, your body follows pretty quickly. So, um, I think like, I, I really like to break the route up into little sections. Um, and I think you can do this like in advance with waypoints or whatever it is, or you can just do it on the fly where it's like, you know, okay, we're here, this next checkpoint, we're going to be at this lake. Like that's what I'm focused on right now. Like just allow yourself to kind of stay present in the moment, because I think a lot of times when you know, you've got 
days or tens or twenties, 30, 40, 50 miles, whatever it is that you have left to travel. Um, it can be really mentally exhausting and fatiguing just to like think through and try to process it, especially when you feel like garbage. Um, so I try to just like focus on one section at a time. Um, and also like one of the cool things about, you know, being out there for a long time is like, there's a lot, <laughs> like there's a lot, a lot of time for something to like go wrong or for you to not feel good. But that also means there's a lot of time for things to reset and get better. Um, and so, you know, I've often found like sometimes like going up um, in one little section, it's just, you don't feel great, but you know, eat, eat some snacks, drink some more water, maybe like pause for a few minutes, keep moving. And chances are like in an hour that's going to pass and you're going to feel a little bit better. So um, yeah, just, just staying mentally tough and kind of breaking things up into like manageable sections, I think can, can help. Yeah, that, that's great advice. Um, one, one kind of like, uh, I guess heuristic device that I use when, when I'm out in the field is, uh, I'm usually towards the end of the day, like maybe in the evening, I'm kind of wiped. Um, and I always think to myself, regardless of the conditions, I, I, you know, I still have 5k in me. I still have three miles in me. Like no matter how tired I am, I know I can do that last three miles. Um, and yep. it, that distance might be different for different people, depending on your fitness. Like it might be like, I know I always have one mile in me, no, regardless of how soaking wet and cold I am, but just keeping that, um, really helps with your mental fortitude. And that's definitely helped me through some like pretty heinous, uh, uh, sections of trail where I just wanted to like set up my tent in a, in a boggy mud pit and <laughs> go to sleep. It's like, I, I still have three miles in me. I know I can get to the next spot. Totally. <laughs> There's another question here to, um, uh, are you able to evaluate snow conditions based on the latest satellite images? So this is, this is more of a non-X specific question. Um, and it's actually something that I, I didn't, I didn't go over. So that's, that's my bad, but what I love to do as well, when I'm, when I'm looking at, especially things like high routes is I actually turn, um, on X into snow mode. Um, and we have amazing, um, imagery there that that's like winter specific. Um, and what I actually like to do is look at this slope aspect, which means where is the sun hitting the slope? that you're on. And that helps me determine the quality of snow that I can experience. So for instance, I know that um, the Ptarmigan Traverse goes through this, uh, through this area, the, the Lacan Glacier. And, and there's also some pictures here of, of uh, Caitlin kind of traversing through it. I can look at um, the slope aspect and know that this does not get a lot of sun. So I can expect the snow to be firm or even icy early in the morning. And that really helps me determine, you know, when I get there, what, what I can expect and what I should, you know, kind of preempt. One other thing that I, I totally forgot to, uh, to show as well is that within our, within our routes, we also have uh, like a weather card yeah. that helps describe, you know, um, the pressure, uh, the wind, the temperature, if there's any precipitation. Um, and it, it's really good at showing also like future forecast. So really helpful for understanding what you can expect when you get there. Looks like it's going to snow here. Um, so maybe not a good time to go in May. <laughs> yeah. And, and just to add in, in terms of like a uh, specific, like weekly satellite images and stuff like that, if you can get that information, I think that's great. Um, but I try to, you know, keep a sense of that on a macro scale, like how is the snowpack changing in general in this region? Um, because ultimately, I think, you know, something can look really different when you're actually like there in the moment. Um, so especially like for glaciers or, you know, cliffy scrambling sections you might be doing, um, you know, that can change pretty drastically even within a few days. Um, and also depending on what the weather and, you know, cloud coverage is and stuff like that is like that day. Yeah, and one, one thing to mention as well is that we actually have snow tell stations uh, within our app too that you can reference for that. Um, for understanding like the volume um, and, and the amount of snow that, that you can expect. And that's also in that snow mode. Um, Kate, uh, Kathy is asking, do you change up your footwear or do you wear the same footwear all the way through difficult trails versus easier trails? Um, Kayla? Yeah. <laughs> no, foot, footwear is like a, the hot topic, right? And um, everyone has, has different tips and tricks. Like I've, I've done a variety. So like I've done routes before where I've 
worn trail running shoes to a certain point and then drop the shoes and put on ski boots or mountaineering boots or climbing boots or something, um, gone to through that section, then come back. Obviously that doesn't work if you're doing a point to point. Um, and, and then also there's been times when I've worn the same pair of shoes for, you know, the entire trip. And I think it really just is going to depend again on what kind of route are you doing? Um, what works for your feet? And also like, what are, what are the conditions? Um, I've, I've definitely found before, especially if you're, you know, going on more mixed terrain, like sometimes, sometimes you can get away with, uh, lighter, you know, lighter shoes on something. And other times you're like, wow, I really wish I had real mountaineering boots. And because of that, now we're bailing. Um, and so I think like, it's a little bit of a, a trade-off, um, that you just have to, Kind of figure out with um you know what what works for you and what your risk tolerance is going to be but oftentimes i think it's like you know <laughs> if you if you're if you're cutting corners there's a, a good chance you're going to end up bailing yeah there i think we have time for one more question and it's it's somewhat related to um it's asking us to please address different types of traction gear that that mm -hmm. we would bring uh for the various types of terrain that that we might encounter um, yeah um so if you, if you don't I, bring the right stuff, you can expect to, to go home or potentially even worse. Exactly. Um, I mean, I think maybe Don, you can even add a little bit about like different types of traction you might want for various types of trails and right. Cause there's a whole range of, of, um, like how, how much tread is on certain shoes. But I think if I'm guessing we're asking a little bit more about like micro spikes or crampons, um, and there's a whole range of, you know, <laughs> whole range of traction. Um, I've, I've used everything from super light micro spikes to like full on semi-auto crampons on, on mountaineering boots. And, you know, you can spread everything in between. Again, it really just depends on, um, on the snow conditions and on the route. So I think it, it can be hard to find that out sometimes. And it, you know, getting recent data from people can be helpful. Um, however, like as just a like little story about this. Like I, I did the Tarmigan Traverse twice within a week um, when I, when I did it two years ago. So the first time was, did it with some friends. We did it slower. We were like, um, I'd never been on it. We were scouting and everything. And then a few days later, I knew what the conditions were like. So I went back with my friend and we, we set the FKT on it. Um, we actually had completely different snow conditions between the two, the two days. Um, and it was, you know, only a few days apart. And so because we had kind of experienced already things changing throughout the day, like we chose to bring multiple types of traction, even though it was more weight, just because we, you know, wanted to make sure that we had the right gear we needed out there. And I, I usually would rather carry something that's a little heavier or, or a little bit more if I know that it's going to give me that security to be able to actually do it safely. Yeah, that's a great call out. I mean, I, I, I've known people who have taken uh, snowshoes on long distance hikes just because they know they are anticipating a couple hundred miles of snow and other people who don't bring anything but micro spikes. Um, but that's also very dependent on time of year, right? So I, I generally like to go later in the season when I know snow is going to be at its lowest point. That comes with its other challenges too, right? Like for instance, red ledges depends on, on a snow bridge to go over and, and hit that a uh, bit of scree, right? So that could, that could be very weak or, or potentially dangerous. So there's always, you know, things to counterbalance and consider, um, when, when you're making a decision about traction and, and, and time of year, cause they're, they're relational. Awesome. I think we're, we're a bit over time, but, um, uh, I, I just want to offer up a, again, um, a special discount for those of, of you who've, who've stuck it out, uh, please feel free to scan that QR code or go to the URL in the chat um, and you uh, will be eligible for a 14 day extended trial or 30% off uh, a premium membership, which is a dang good deal. So please take advantage of it. Um, otherwise you can uh, feel free to go to our website, onyxmaps.com. We have lots of tutorials about things like offline maps, layers, base maps, other tools. We have a, a ton of great blog posts and articles that are very informative. Um, we also have YouTube demos and we have world-class customer support. So feel free to reach out and ask any, any questions you might have. Um, and also last but not least, be on the lookout for more Onyx Backcountry Masterclasses. Thank you so much.
Thanks Taylor. everyone for joining. Have fun and get after it. <laughs> yeah. Take care, everyone. Thank you.